So we'll, I'll let anyone in as, um, as people show up, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. This will be recorded. So anyone that wasn't able to join us, we'll be sending it out to the folks that did RSVP for this event. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from Chef Jade Mers, Chef Nathan Scott and Chef Carvin Emmerich today. Um, so we're gonna quickly go over some of the overviews of both the culinary arts program and the restaurant management program. So I will let them take it away. All right. So um, we offer many different um, options here in our program. Um, the most common uh, and well-known is the uh, associate's degree in culinary arts. Um, this is a two-year program with an externship uh, the summer between your first and second year. Your first year is all of your basic um, knife skills, soup stocks and sauces, um, some intro to baking, all the stuff you really need to know in order to go farther um into the culinary arts um in between your first and second year you get an externship or not depending covid wise um but ideally you get an externship which means you get a paid job in the field um, in a kitchen for school credit um, once you've completed that you come back uh in your second year and our second year usually before covid happened um uh, surrounds a restaurant that's open to the public so you learn front of house service, you learn line cooking, um, maitre d' station, baking bread, everything that you need to know to run a restaurant. Um, and that's the second year. Um, if you're not so sure if you want to, can we go to the layout here of the program? Cool. So this is what your uh, associate's degree program would look like, uh, broken down into semesters. So it can be adjusted a little bit. Um, but this is ideal. Um, and if you're interested in culinary arts, but you don't really, you're not sure, or you um, only want to put about a year into it, we do offer a certificate program. Um, so that is one year. It's just your first year there. You stop at the um, summer semester and you'll receive a certificate um, to be a food service specialist. So this qualifies you um, basically to get an entry level job into any kitchen um, or food service establishment. Um, if you're more interested in the um, managerial side of the culinary industry, we can also help you with that. Um, we have an associate's degree in restaurant management. Um, it is a two-year program. The first year is exactly the same as the um, culinary arts program, but the second year adds um, some business classes in. So we have a great business program here at the school, and we work um, in conjunction with them to uh, form an overall program for restaurant management. Um, what's really great about the restaurant management program is that once you have a culinary arts degree, a your associate's degree, it's only six more classes and you'll also have an associate's degree in restaurant management. So you just add six business classes to your culinary arts degree and you have two associate's degrees um, in less time than if you were to do them both separately. Um, and as I said, here's a layout for um, how the management program works. Um, as you can see, the first year is almost identical to the culinary arts degree. Um, and then the, with, instead of doing uh, an externship, you go on to do um, business classes. All right, so we can move to Nathan, I think. Um, Jeff Scott is going to talk to you a little bit about what we've done to change our first year um, a little bit um, to make it more accessible to a wider group of people. Great, thank you. Uh, so in your first year, you'd have a number of lecture classes. Uh, most of them deal with your uh, like sanitation skills, your major um, culinary math, that sort of stuff, as well as um, information on the history of culinary arts. We have courses in food management, sanitation, as well as just general skills development. Two of the big courses that we just recently changed were the labs in our first year. And they used to be just one big course but we found that we wanted to offer students more opportunity to get more individualized attention. This is one of those areas of study where some people come to us with years of experience in the industry 
and other people come to us really having never held anything sharper than a butter knife before. And so we really wanted to make sure that our students got very individualized attention. So our new lab format includes two labs that work very closely together. The first one is your culinary arts lab, and the second is culinary arts instruction. And really these work together to again, give you a very individualized uh, attention and education. Uh, the culinary arts instruction course I'll show you takes place in kind of our fun kitchen. I'll switch my camera here so you can see it. It's kind of set up almost a little bit more like a, kind of like a studio kitchen, but it gives us a chance to come together and really work as a small team and figure out what people's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and really give you an individualized uh, education that really sets Eastern Maine's culinary arts department apart from a lot of the other culinary arts institutions in the state. So it's kind of a fun, sort of pretty setup. And actually while I'm here, I'll show you some of our required equipment. This is our knife kit. Uh, this is made especially for Eastern Maine by the Mercer Cutlery Corporation. It has all the knives you need for uh, your program of study here. It's multiple compartments of tools and equipment that's really fun. Uh, and we also have some really great textbooks that we rely upon. Uh, Wayne Gislin's Professional Cooking and Professional Baking are really great texts that we use in that first year. Now, uh, how do we approach education in the culinary arts labs? What we've done is basically break our education up into uh, the brigade system. And if you've never heard of the classical brigade, it is a way of, or it was a system developed by a very famous French chef called Augustus Escoffier. And Escoffier looked at all of the work that the professional kitchen has to do, and he broke the kitchen down into different departments, with each department doing a very specific job or handling a very specific food. So you might have one department that just deals with seafood, and another department that deals just with yeast breads, and another one that deals with making soups. And the idea was to create this sort of hierarchy that somebody could enter the professional kitchen at the bottom, basically as a dishwasher, and work his or her way up all through these different positions in the kitchen and eventually over the course of, of very many years uh, become a professional chef, become the executive chef after years and years of study. So we have modified our curriculum to basically work off of the same system. And instead of dedicating years of your life, you're usually dedicating about one to two weeks of your life to studying each individual position in the kitchen and the important skills and equipment and tools and ingredients that are necessary in that part of the kitchen. And so that's how we, we do it. We start with the very introductory ones in the first year, uh, using a lot of, of, of the soups and sauces uh, to demonstrate these different positions and these different skills. And as you go into the second semester, we do more of the intermediate work. And that's when we start to really get into the fun stuff. We really start doing a lot of roasting and baking and, and dealing with fish and saute station and all of that fun stuff. But it also really mirrors what is done in the industry. So you're getting an education that really automatically shows you how this applies to what you're going to do when you go out there and get a job. So that's the, really the, the spiel on the first year. I'll send it back to Chef Van Emmerich, who should be in the kitchen now, looks like, uh, to talk about uh, the next part. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to take a quick moment because I forgot to mention, um, I was going to bring up, someone asked about ServeSafe and if it is um, preferred that you have prior experience with ServeSafe. Absolutely. Um, not only will it help you um, in the kitchen stay more safe, um, but also if you have the uh, ServeSafe uh, Food Service Manager, a certificate, um, you can actually bypass the sanitation course in your first year. Um, so that's one class off your plate that you don't have to do if you already have that certificate and can prove that that you have passed and have obtained that certificate. Um, notice that this is different than the uh, food handlers um, certificate that a lot of uh, tech schools are teaching. Um, it's a, a little bit more advanced one than that. Um, but if you do get that, one class off your first year of college. Um, so that's a great help. So yes, we're gonna head into the kitchen here. Um, Chef Demers is in here with a few, uh, couple of our um, seniors and they are preparing a dish for us, so. Oh. 
tell you guys. Colorado, how are you? Good. Why don't you tell us what you're up to? Thanks for joining us. So we're going to make some risotto today. Risotto is something that's pretty, I think, seems a little overwhelming to some people. It's one of those restaurant dishes. It might be a little scary, but coming to culinary school is really about learning technique, and there's lots of technique involved in risotto. Quite simply, here are all the ingredients to make it. Very straightforward. Just need a saute pan. I prefer one with some higher sides because we do some pretty vigorous stirring. Uh, apart from that, your ingredients are short grain rice. We're using arborio. Um, it's probably a great choice there. We also have a, a carnaroli rice, but arborio is the one most people will be able to find in the grocery store. We, we need some fat, fat of any type. We're going to use some olive oil today. Um, we started one earlier with a little bit of chicken fat. You could use butter to get this started. All those are fine. We're going to sweat some onions. So while we're talking about that, why don't we go ahead and start sweating some onions right here while we're talking about the rest of the ingredients. So to sweat the onions, we really want to make sure that we're just trying to get them translucent, so clear. You know, so they go the translucent term. We don't want to toast them. We don't want to really saute them. So we're going to get a couple of tablespoons of fat. There's no recipe. We're not posting a recipe for this. Again, I'm talking about technique. You can Google any recipe you want for risotto and get your proportion, uh, but it's really about understanding technique, and that's what we want to do here. We want to start heating our fat. I'm on a pretty, I'd say a medium low flame. We just, again, want to sweat those onions. So once you get your fat in the bottom of there, go ahead and sprinkle in your diced onions. Again, I talked about technique. Dicing onions is another one of those techniques that you learn how to properly dice an onion. Uh, it may sound rudimentary, but we dice food every day, and you'll only get better and faster at it as you move along. This is probably going to take five to seven minutes, and because of the magic of TV, we're going to move down the line here in a minute. While we're waiting for that, we're going to go ahead and just look at the other ingredients. So we've got the rice. We're using saffron. You may not have access to this. It's pretty expensive. My tip for this would be TJ Maxx or Marshalls. You could probably get a small container of it. But it runs about $100 an ounce, but it's going to be soft. So what we have, we have going already. We've got some track made chicken stock, and then we add that saffron to it. So you can see the beautiful color. Actually, if you look at this plate where I have the ladle setting, see the beautiful yellow color. So that's flavoring the stock. If you don't have homemade chicken stock, no big deal. Get a low sodium stock or take a regular chicken stock and then add some uh, water to it. Probably about two parts of water. In addition to that, we're going to finish it with some butter and spend a little bit of money on, on, on good Parmesan cheese. Parmigiano Reggiano, the real stuff. Okay? And that's going to make a big difference in the flavor. You can hear those starting to do their thing. And that's all well and good, but we're going to move right down the row. The only other thing we have is salt and pepper and a little bit of butter. So these onions have reached that translucent stage. You can see the big difference there. If we look back at the other ones, you can see they're just starting. And that took five to seven minutes. Once that's done, go ahead and toss those around the pan a little bit. And just bring this pan back to temperature. We're going to go ahead and add our rice to this. We're going to get all than that fat. Scott's going to laugh at my Italian here, but the terms of it is called foot for cura. Pretty bad, right? But yeah, yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> so yeah, so if we have the Italian words, it basically means, oh, excuse me, toast for cura, which it sounds like toast. So we're going to toast the rice. So talking about the arborio for a second here while we're going ahead and um, letting this rice toast. As I mentioned, arborio is a short grain rice, and we choose it for risotto because of the starches that are in it. It starts on the outside of the rice called amylopectin, and that's the starch that makes risotto creamy. When we finish this dish, you're going to think there's cream in it, but there's no cream whatsoever. The starch is on the inside with amylose. Amylose is what's going to keep it kind of toothsome. Some people like the term al dente on the inside of this when it's done. So our Oreo is going to give us that perfect texture. A lot of times when we cook rice, long grain rice, if you cook it at home, we don't stir it because we reduce all those starches and it makes it sticky. So that's part of what we're looking to do here. So that's nice and toasted now. I'm not looking to brown it. I am just looking for that to turn white all the way across instead of in the center. And you can see that's the case there right now. That's what we're looking for. And if you could only smell this, we can really smell the fragrance that's coming through here right now. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to start adding our stock. So we, we want a warm stock to this. It's probably one of the biggest keys for risotto. We want a nice warm stock. And we're cooking about a half a cup of rice. 
portion for two people. And one of the things that I didn't do here, because I wanted everyone to be able to do this, because I'm thinking some of you at home may not be old enough to purchase white wine, is I deglazed this pan with stock. Another thing that we could use is a dry white wine. If we were trying to keep this authentically Italian, I'd choose an agave or a vermentino. Pinot Grigio is probably the easiest one to find. Uh, you could use a, a Chardonnay that's on oak or something like that. That would give this dish some acid. Again, I'm not doing it here because many of you probably don't have access to wine. So don't worry about it. Just go there. If you want to add a little acid, a little squeeze of lemon or a splash of vinegar would bring that acid to the game here. Or if you have wine, instead of that first ladle full of stock I put in, just a couple of ounces of white wine. If uh, your parents may have some, some of you might have a dry cherry, that would be perfect too. So once we start adding the stock, now it's about stirring. We really just want to keep this on about a medium flame. It should take a couple of minutes to absorb all the stock for each addition. The first one absorbs very quickly because we're deglazing the pan to release all the flavor from the bottom. Okay. And you'll see when it's ready for more, as you can see it starting to streak across the bottom of the pan there. You want it to drag. You want the rice to stick a little bit. Each one of these additions helps release that starch and release that amylopectin that I talked about. So it ends up making this dish very creamy. So this is the time consuming part of risotto. This process takes 15 minutes. And it would be pretty tiring for you to watch me stir, stir, stir for 15 minutes. I'm going to take it to the point in which we're going to add one more stock, and then we're going to move right down the line, show you one that is looking pretty darn good. So in the meantime, we just had a question about what the um, average class time is per day. Do either of you want to answer that? Sure. So in the first year, the classes, the last class, kitchen classes, average four hours. In the second year, we bump that up to seven hours. So uh, we kind of break you in uh, gently, if you will. So a little more time uh, in the second year, because as part of the second year, which I'll talk about here in a second, um, we run a restaurant in the non-COVID times. Uh, we certainly have some differences that we can do there. So in the first year, we don't have that. So uh, yeah, it gives you a chance to kind of build up your stamina a little bit, if you will. Okay. So you saw when I added that, and we keep stirring and stirring. If you're a pan shaker, you can certainly do that. You know, keep it moving that way, but keep it on the heat as well. Right? So we're going to do that. Uh, your ratio, about two and a half to three cups of stock to every cup of rice. How do you know what it's enough? This is one of those things you need to taste frequently. That's the hard part of doing this in COVID time. If we didn't know what to look for, we take a little bit of this out and move to the other room. Home, so just keep taking this going. We're going to move right down to this one. As you can see, the rice has absorbed a lot of that stock. Look at that. Look at the color from that saffron. Just gorgeous. Now, to know it's perfect, you would want to taste this and have that little bit of crunch in the middle. Crunch is too strong of a word. Toothsomeness, el dente. You want a little bit of firmness. If you, the downside of our Oreo very easily overtook. If you go too far, it won't be bad. It'll just be mushy. Think mac and cheese, right? When it's overdone, it's kind of mushy. So from here, we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to start finishing this. And to finish it, we are going to go ahead and add the couple of things that we haven't done yet. And that's going to be the Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Are you ready to stir? We're going to stir like crazy, okay? So we're going to be very liberal. And you know, don't be pounding, that's probably gonna be about a half a cup. Just about the same amount that you had in your rice. And as you can see, it's looking just a little bit dry there. The other thing we finish it with is a little bit of butter. Okay. And Brenda's gonna stir like the dickens now for about until all that butter melts and incorporates. And that term that I'm gonna butcher is Monte Thank you, Monte Catura which doesn't directly translate in Italian from what I understand, but it really refers to the butter and the process of stirring. Look at that. See how we didn't put any cream in this? Yeah, it's looking creamy and amazing. The only thing we have to do from it here is final seasoning. And that's just a little bit of salt and parts of ground pepper. That would be the taste. So from experience, I know roughly how much we're going to need. So we're going to get that half a teaspoon or so for the amount we have. And a couple turns of freshly cracked pepper. That's going to be good. And then we're going to grab a warm bowl. Grab a couple of warm bowls here. 
And if that's the right texture, Brenda, that should just pour straight into the center of that bowl. Okay, so just taste one. That's a nice dinner size portion. Usually done as a starter course in Italian cuisine, one of the primo, your first course. But we are going to go ahead and do this as a single main course. Okay. And you don't see that cheese pull? That's some okay. internet gold. That's gold right <laughs> a little bit of freshness back to the dish, just a little bit of fresh chopped Italian flat meat parsley. There you have it. Risotto, don't be intimidated. It's all about technique. You'll learn those techniques coming to school here. Once you learn those techniques, they can be applied to many dishes across the curriculum. That was fun. I think I'm supposed to talk about second year classes. Do we want to go out for a little yep, more? Yeah, we'll go out to the dining room. Excuse our transitioning. We're, do, we're doing this. We're really getting hooked with this audio video stuff. <laughs> this is new. So, uh, welcome. My name is Chef Demers. I've been teaching here at the college for 23 years now, uh, 27 years overall, from different places that I've taught. Been working in the industry since I was 14 years old. I think I have a lot to offer you. Uh, currently, I'm teaching for first year classes. I teach culinary sanitation and theory and food and beverage management. And for second year, uh, classical French cuisine and international cuisine, and those courses usually revolve around us running a restaurant. Uh, currently, the restaurant's not open, as not everyone's invited back to campus yet, as far as the public. But we're transitioning a little bit there and still learning all about French cuisine, all about the service. We're just not able to practice it on live guests, so we practice in class, and everybody gets a chance to do that. So as someone mentioned before, the classes vary in length, and second-year classes are, are longer than the first-year classes because we're doing more production, we're doing more volume, we're waiting, actually taking, running a full restaurant. The students are responsible for everything uh, when they're doing that. In the current times, they're learning all about the cuisine and getting to make everything from each menu packet from the different regions, et cetera. And international cuisine is framed in the same way, but instead of focusing on the classical French elements that we um, do in the first semester, the second semester, we go all around the globe. We pick about a dozen different cuisines. One is Italian, which we just saw a little taste of there. I butcher the Italian. I didn't spend time in Italy like Jeff Scott, so I don't know the words, but I know the food. <laughs> um, so you'll learn, again, it, it's all about technique. And once you learn the technique, once you learn how to properly grill, sear, braise, that's the big one we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, students fabricated some chickens and we made poulet chop stir. Braise that chicken until it's pork tender. It starts falling apart, but still holds its shape. You'll learn different things like that. You'll also learn how to blend cuisine. One of my favorite things to put on top of risotto is um, uh, duck confit, uh, learning how to uh, cook something in its own fat until it's absolutely falling apart and delicious. A duck confit leg on top of that risotto is just probably my, my last meal request, if you would. It's just something absolutely amazing when it comes to food. Uh, I kind of scooted over the first year classes a little bit. Those are lecture based, uh, depending on the class that you would have there. It could be uh, completely face to face, it could be hybrid, it could be all online. Uh, we offer them in different formats, and we did that even before COVID. There are many ways that those classes can be offered, all of which we found are successful. It really depends on your learning style. Those are all things that you could expect. Um, I know they kind of talked about the first year, but just to, to, to dovetail in on those couple of classes that I teach in the first year. And apart from that, uh, the second year, uh, Kuchuk, do, do you want to talk about uh, pastry in advance? Sure. Yeah, sure. So we'll switch sides here. <laughs> Me again. Hello. Am I in frame? You're beautiful. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I didn't really introduce myself very well. Um, so my name is Cara Van Emmerich. Um, I have been in industry for about 13 years. I taught here at the school for five. Um, I'm also a graduate of the program here, so I can absolutely vouch for how great it is. Um, I teach um, one class of culinary skills development in the first year. Um, so your culinary math, you know, the fun stuff. Um, and then I teach in your second year uh, pastry arts, advanced pastry arts, and advanced culinary skills. Um, pastry arts is something close to my heart as I am a pastry chef by trade, um, and I have my own baking company outside of school. Um, so I will teach you everything from the classical French pastry um, to the new modern um, molecular gastronomy desserts um, to bread making, which is super popular right now. Everyone wants to make their own bread. I'll teach you how to do that here the right way. Um, and <laughs> then we'll move on to advanced culinary skills, which is absolutely blast to teach. Um, uh, 
usually we will do uh, advanced butchery. I'll have butchers um, from that are local come in um, and show you how to butcher whole pigs, whole cows. Um, cheese making, we'll go, before COVID happened, I would tour you around um, local food supply businesses um, and really connect you with the people in the industry um, who are near and dear to us here in the community. Um, so that's where I'm most passionate about here at the school. And I also am a sous chef here in addition, so I assist every single other culinary arts class that happens here. So you will see me a lot, <laughs> whether you like it or not. <laughs> You'll love it. Ta -da. All right, so now we're going to introduce Panda, um, who is uh, one of our second year students and also a CTE school graduate. So Panda, I want you to tell us a little bit about what your uh, decision was to come here, why you chose us. I originally hadn't wanted to go to college at all, but when I got into the tech school and I started taking culinary arts classes, I kind of realized that, wow, you know, I could make a career out of this. And ultimately my career choice is to go back and teach culinary arts at that technical center. But I need to get my degree here first. So I chose here because as you see, the teachers are very personable, it's a great atmosphere and it's great student staff. Wonderful, thank you. So you touched a little bit on what you wanna do after you graduate. Is that your long-term goal is to teach? Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, sir. That's great. Thank you for sharing your experience. We're glad to have you here. All right, Mariah, I think I'm going to kick it back to you to conclude. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you guys for that wonderful information. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, let me know or um, let any of our chefs know. You can always email admissions and ask them questions. We'll have this recorded and be able to send it out um, once everything's downloaded and all set. So. Um, thank you all for joining and thank you, especially culinary department. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your day.